What is the meaning of acceptance? I still remember the words of the Tlaxishi professor asking that in class, his narrow tongue darting out of his green mouth to lick his eyeballs clean. He did it more than most of his species, and as a budding xenobiologist I knew that meant he was uncomfortable among so many students. Unsurprising since his species was known to be primarily made up of loners. That alone made him unique in this job. But more than that, what made him most exceptional was the way he understood species other than his own. Hence his question, and it was the very question that launched whole careers, because it began with a race called Homo sapiens, or as they typically called themselves, humans. No answer followed his question, though many of us, with claws and tentacles and nails and more, were rapidly scrolling through the digital text to search for the word. The echo of his question faded away against the walls. And this, too, was what made him unique. Unlike most professors in the university, he conducted classes in person, demanding we socialize up close. For reasons none of us quite understood, it somehow made us better students, and little by little his policy was spreading to other instructors. What is the meaning of family? He asked the follow-up question, and our hasty searching picked up speed. My neighbor, a Chetilxian with a rubber touch assist over his slimy digit, was typing the new word into the search bar. A hand went up before mine. A biological classification including several subclassification. The answer came from one of the miniature dwarf species, an avian race coated in spiny feathers. It came up no higher than my knee. His name was Chirupus, and he was top of the class. After me. My frustration burned as he outdid me, only for relief to flood my air sacs when the professor shook his head. Even with the breath adapter implants, I found being outdone suffocating. No, that is a definition, but not the one I mean. Our Talaxishi professor, Exlith by name, licked each of his five eyes in rapid succession. I knew that he hated correcting people, but I also knew that the definition he sought was not in this book, so I raised my fur-covered arm and opened my elongated jaw. My tongue wagged as I spoke, and I tried to keep my tail still when I said, Professor, no other meaning is present in the book, please. Can you tell us what you mean? In all my life I had never heard the noise he made next. It was clear he was imitating some species we had not seen up close, and here is where it all began. He pushed a button somewhere out of view, and a curious creature appeared on the screen while his mouth made this haw-haw-haw kind of noise that couldn't have been natural to him. On screen was a bipedal species with fur on their round heads, small thin lips and only two arms. This is the species you will learn the answers to those questions from. If you can understand this species, you can understand any species. In my 150 cycles of instruction and research, I have never found another like this one. They bond with inanimate objects, fictional characters, unknown infants, outsiders, as strongly as a Vastian oviraptor with its own eggs. We gasped, chirped, gulped, belched, and rattled. Whatever our own expressions of shock as different species, we made it. I know, it sounds impossible, but this is the only species that is capable of finding family and forming communities out of any species, or at least any, that they have ever been observed with. They domesticate predators and bond even with species that might otherwise eat them. If one is rejected by its parents, it may find new ones or ones to fill that role. There are stronger species, there are smarter species, there are faster species, there are longer-lived species. But there are no species more passionate. They are in their mating season all year long and constantly form new groups that grow and change. If you can get one to bond with you, they will die for you without regret. There is no species so full of contradiction as the Homo sapiens sapiens. They love more deeply, hate more deeply, laugh. That was that noise I was making earlier and are both greed and generosity given flesh. They appear weak, but because of all these contradictions, they are not only the apex predator of their planet, but no invading armada dares cross into a system where a human colony has formed bonds with others. The great victory of 47592 was brought about by this species, acting on a distress call from my own species when I was a child. A human starship responded instinctively to our call for aid, and destroyed themselves in a suicide run which crippled the invaders. Self-termination for another species. Who has ever heard of that? The professor paused at the rhetorical question. It did seem at odds with all reason. No species I knew would do that. And though I'd heard of that victory, 
The strange vessel was barely a footnote. Humans were not even named. A low rumble of uttered doubt passed among us all. I promise you, it is true. I was there. That was the cause of the peace which followed. Self-termination for another species was unheard of, and the Zenti didn't know what to make of it. I was present on the station while the impromptu negotiations took place, and the study of humans by both sides began. I knew I had to learn more, and spent my life among them as soon as I was able. I spent one hundred of their years in a single human community. Within ten years I gained acceptance. Not long after that I was neighbor, then brother and uncle. I watched their generation grow and age and die, and to my shock, I felt that grief myself. To know humanity's depths is to find them in ourselves. That is how I got here. That is why. He leveled his shaking finger claw out toward us in our seats, and we all sat a little more alertly when he did so. You are sitting among one another. All of you comprise long-lived species, three hundred years on the high end, and all of you will spend the next fifty years in an extended study of humans. You will join their communities, learn about them, and about yourselves. When you are through, you will know what family means in a way that you never dreamed before, and carry that spark out to all your home worlds. From there, who can say what will happen? But I... I think we will have a better galaxy for it. I don't know why I felt so certain that he was right. Maybe because his reputation was so widespread. Maybe because he'd chosen us, handpicked each of his students, and his faith in us made us more confident in him. But whatever the reason, I was suddenly even more eager to study than before. And even if I don't like it, what's fifty years, I thought. What I didn't know yet, but would know beyond a doubt when I was in the last days of my fiftieth year, was that the answer to my question was, the best years of my life. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Of course I should tell you my species. I'm Dlamisa. We're a furry species with four upright ears on either side of our head that are slightly triangular, with tails that grow about as long as a human arm, legs that can curve at the knee, and though we have two arms, we're capable of locking the elbow joints so that we can run on all fours as well as on two legs. Our mouths are elongated and have a row of sharp teeth, and though our fur color varies, mine is a mix of russet red and black. If that paints a good enough picture for you, fine. If not, well I must hope they cast my actor well when this is made into video program for entertainment. To be blunt, as I would be very embarrassed to learn, I look somewhat similar to their dogs. What a day that was. At least it turned out to be helpful. Now back to... that day. A few of our number chose not to make the trip, a thing I think they would regret for the rest of their lives as the human sector was very far away, taking months of travel by even the fastest ship. At least until the humans invented the new pulpulsion method of redoubling speed by electron recombination. But that's for the astrochemophysics department. Me? I was only concerned with learning as much as I could, and the professor proved he earned his status by providing us with a wealth of information in the days that led up to our trip. Human entertainment, mythology, music, religion, and social conventions for the place we would be staying, all were provided to us. That was the first time I realized just why Homo sapiens sapiens can be so terrifying. It wasn't their love of fear. There were whole genres of entertainment that kept their psychology on edge, but that in and of itself was enough to drive two more students to drop out. Fear is something all other known species avoid, but humans. Humans embrace the void. I found it fascinating. The part that scared me was what it took for humans to picture a threat. Gods, demons, natural disasters that wipe out planets, aliens whose technology defied reality. Humans needed the impossible to feel threatened. Anything else was just an ordinary day in the galactic mini-cycle and in all their terrifying films and televised series, the story was a journey to human triumph. Some thought it was self-aggrandizing, but our teacher put it this way. Humans made that leap into the void in a tenth of the time it took my species to find the courage to do so. Humans define themselves by their will to overcome anything, to drive themselves to the limit and push beyond to make new limits for the next generation to overcome. Dying for a friend? Dying for an ideal? A human will throw away their life for an infant where most would consider their offspring expendable and just make another. And they will die happy if they believe their death made a better tomorrow. Their films tell us that they see themselves as having boundless potential. And when I was a small one, listening to the telecom where the humans came in with cannons blazing just because they said they would help us, I came to believe in it too. 
It took me ages to find a translation for yippee ki yay motherfucker, but the telecom was still broadcasting after that, up to the moment their ship collided with our attackers. And I heard something I'd never heard before when intelligent races died. Music. They died to the sound of music and singing death songs. They are something to fear, but also something to hope for, as you will see. I immersed myself in more of their media on the long journey. Pirate movies where pirates, the lowest of the low, still found it in themselves to die with courage. War films, so many of those, with people giving up their lives for causes, even when they knew they couldn't bring to reality. Romances where that curious passionate bonding was on full display. I admit I found it strange how they bonded to predator pets, but it was impossible to deny that this was what I was seeing when their dog creatures were cradled and cared for, like infants. Nobody really thinks about how powerful bonding truly is, and yet, now my snout was rubbed right in it. It was two months later when we encountered the first human patrols. Their vessels were much bigger than they used to be, and that was when I learned something more interesting. Humans brought their miniature communities into space. Their families, bonded mates, children, even in some cases, they're old who we would normally leave behind. It seemed strange, but when I first saw a human face, that was even stranger. They were flat, with very small noses in the middle of their face. The human who spoke to my professor on screen had a thick black fur around his mouth and deep-set eyes that seemed small compared to mine, but after a few pleasantries and an ID exchange, we were allowed to dock. Our professor then selected three of us to join him on board the human vessel, a chance to explore a little of the miniature society that humans formed before we reached the whole hive of them on their homeworld, where our host families waited for us. The vessel we docked at was military, with giant canyons the size of whole buildings back home, a hallmark of the human design philosophy of big explosions are the best kind. But because these vessels were so large, when we crossed the boarding tubes, we found a small hover vehicle waiting for us. The hover vehicle was interesting. Most races instinctively put the driver at the front, but humans regularly rethought their designs, challenging the ideas that were normal at whatever time they lived. This hover vehicle was one such example of being rethought. It did have the aerodynamic design, and was clearly made to traverse these halls. That much was clear, most notably because the hall in which we stood had a glowing green line along the floor on which the hovercar was centered. However, the driver was not at the front, rather they were at the center, and while we were seated upright with adjustable chairs, the driver sat in a forward crouch with legs bent and arms forward holding onto a bar, her body secured by a double bar cage that framed her body after wrapping around from one side. A series of monitors surrounded her face providing long-range feedback and data about any obstacles in the view and providing me with a reflection of her face. I didn't recognize it at the time, but now I realize she was eager to begin. This highlighted my second experience with human design philosophy. There is no such thing as too fast, only how fast you can make it go. It was no wonder they invented the method of transport that finally broke the subspace speed limit that baffled scientists for ages. Strap in and hold tight. A small human female, or so I assumed it to be because of what we'd been told about Chest's voice pitch, told us. The strap was a four-point harness, and there was a crossbar in front that we were meant to hold on to if things got too intense. And then my tongue was yanked out of my mouth and the ship became a blur. Never in my life had I been both so thrilled and so damn scared. The air battered my face and carried my fur back behind me. My tail wiggled with joy underneath my seat, and I could see what I recognized as a smile on the woman's face. She used her whole body to control the vehicle, leaning left and right. And it was after this that I learned about another unique human innovation that catered to human obsessions. They loved the feel of wind in their hair, and our hover car had no roof. The force of the air should have been far more unpleasant, but it had a curious sort of shielding. Invisible to the naked eye, it permitted ingress and egress of air particles, but in substantially reduced quantities. In short, it was hypoxic, giving humans a feeling of high-altitude intoxication and letting them experience great speeds while they got it. Our companions made noises of alarm. Chitin scales shed and my Ulian roommate's stink sack activated briefly causing the hovercraft to swerve while following the green line which went from floor to wall to ceiling. My instincts told me what was coming, and I held on for dear life while the human made a noise I later learned was laughter when she kept swerving until we followed the green paint track and we were upside down. 
You would not believe how hard it was to find a proper translation for the word we that she kept screaming as we looped around the empty corridor. We finally lurched to a stop that rattled my bones, and my professor finally said something, something I knew was key to introducing oneself to new humans. Shall we grab a beer? I knew from the videos that the human woman's grin made the rest of our trip promising, but as my companions were voiding their orifices onto the floor while trying to unhitch themselves, they unfortunately missed it. As to what happened next, well, you'd hardly believe it if you haven't lived it, but I swear every word is true.